Then some slides on uh, image analysis. And most of that will be on kinetic modeling, but I start with uh, uh, some some easier stuff first. First, yeah, and I guess you know that. So in in PET, the well, for, for a very long time there was no quantification at all because in the beginning when PET became popular clinically, that was for uh, tumor detection in oncology. So FTG was used for that. And then uh, no attenuation correction was done. The MDs looked at the images to identify metastases. And then depending on what they found, that would change the, yeah, the, uh, the, the treatment of the patient. But then uh, more and more, it becomes quant quantitative because they quickly found that uh, PET is the most sensitive machine to see if a, a new, if a particular uh, anti-cancer treatment is effective or not. And so uh, it, there is many cases where a treatment is effective in a fraction of the patient, but not in another uh, part of the patients. And they want to know that as quickly as possible first, because probably they have alternative treatments that they could try on those patients. And second, even if they don't, they still want to know if the treatment is effective, because many of these treatments have also side effects. And if the treatment doesn't help, then actually all you get is side effects. And that's a reason to stop the treatment. So they want to get that feedback as soon as possible because it heavily impacts what they're going to do uh, to help the patient. And so one uh, simple way to do that is to use standardized uptake value. And this is how it's defined. So you take the tracer concentration in a particular voxel and you divide it by the average trace, tracer concentration in the patient. So if instead of a patient, you use a phantom filled with water and you inject some activity and you wait till the activity is uniformly distributed, then the SUV in the phantom is one by definition because it's the ratio of what you, the local concentration to the average concentration. In a patient, of course, it will not be one. It will, for FTG, for example, be always very high in the brain because the brain is heavily accumulating uh, FTG. So to measure that in practice, the average tracer concentration is usually determined from the injected dose. So we know that because we have measured it in the uh, uh, dose calibrator and we divide by the total weight of the patient. Now the tracer concentration from the PET actually comes in becquerel per milliliter. So we assume that the density of the patient is one and then we can swap the, the milliliters for gram. But of course, the whole thing is yeah, a bit sloppy. <clears throat> and that's why it's controversial. So there are people that are very strong about kinetic modeling and they say this SUV means silly, useless value because uh, it, it's totally unreliable. But that's not true because it's been used for many years. It has been shown to be effective, but you have to be very careful with it because if I measure the SUV, well, if I, if I scan uh, instead of one hour after injection, I scan one hour and a half after injection, all SUVs change because the, the tumors and, and the rest of the body keeps on accumulating FTG. So the FTG distribution still changes uh, after uh, an hour. That affects the SUV. If you drink coffee or not, or in general, the condition of the patient also affects the SUV. So, uh, yeah, also the, the state of your dose calibrator affects it. If it's poorly calibrated, that will directly go into the SUV. So there is a lot of variation there. And for example, Ronald Poulart has done a lot of studies comparing SUVs in different sites by sending phantoms to them. And he finds that in some sites, the reproducibility of the SUV is pretty good. And in others, it's extremely poor. So to have a reliable SUV means that you control everything, your dose calibrator, the clinical procedure, the time after injection. So if all that is rigid, then it works well. And if you're sloppy in all these aspects, then you get lousy SUVs. So that, that calibration and, and standardization is very important. But it's used all the time, and the MDs are pretty happy with it. So, but we should be stressed about it because the, the medical doctors, they, if they see an SUV change of 10% or more, they start uh, taking that serious. And to get a, an error of 10% in PET is a very easy thing to do. So we need to be very, very careful with calibration because they want to be as sensitive as possible. And, and even small changes are taken very seriously. 
here another uh, example of, of some image analysis. And I used um, the images of the heart because a very long time ago, I've been working on, on developing cardiac software. Instead, I could have picked brain or, or, or oncology examples. And so here is this uh, image analysis software. So for example, this is a, yeah, one clinical procedure is to do ammonia and FTG. And so uh, uh, nitrogen 13 has a short half-life of uh, 20 minutes. Of, yeah, and, and FTG, uh, F18 of two hours. So the ammonia is given first. And then when it's sufficiently decayed, then the uh, FTG is injected. And ammonia is a perfusion tracer. So the accumulation of the ammonia in the tissues is dominated by the perfusion more than by the, the metabolism of the cells. So the reason that there is not a lot of ammonia here is because the perfusion is limited. So we know uh, a vessel that should provide blood to this part of the left ventricle is occluded uh, because there is almost no blood arriving here. And then we have a look at the FTG. And so, well, the, the heart can burn anything. So it, it can use uh, fatty acids or glucose or whatever. It can get energy out of anything. And so you can uh, calibrate the glucose concentration or control the glucose concentration in the blood of the patient. And by doing that, you encourage the heart to accumulate glucose, to, 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 you know, to burn glucose. And then if you then inject FTG, then uh, you, you see the oxidative metabolism of the heart. And then in addition, if uh, a piece of the heart tissue is in trouble and doesn't get enough blood, then that, that tissue starts um, favoring glucose because you can get more energy by burning glucose than by burning other molecules. And so here, for example, we see that although there is uh, a decreased perfusion, the glucose is not decreased, and that means that these this, uh, tissues are still alive, the muscle is alive, and that the patient should be treated. If we open a blood vessel, it's, it's likely the patient will be better because that, that piece of myocardium is still alive. Now you could analyze the 3D images, but instead, often 2D images are made, and that's easier because you, you can see everything in one uh, 2D image. And this is basically the way how it's done. So this is the left ventricle, um, there is also a right ventricle and the atria, of course, but the left ventricle is the um, most important part and also the part that we can best see. And so you take the left ventricle and you basically open it up and flatten it. <clears throat> and to do that, it, that requires a lot of deformation. So that means that the, the base here is heavily deformed compared to the apex. So here we can see immediately that there is clearly a perfusion defect here, um, going from the apex all the way to the base, and that there is no corresponding uh, uh, defect in the FTG image. But the area of this defect in that polar map, or in that bullseye as they call it, is not proportional to the real area. But the program can compute the associated area because we can follow back every pixel. We know this pixel is actually coming from here and we can compute the original volume that is uh, represented by that pixel. All right. <clears throat> and so again, uh, once we have images like that, we have the ammonia image, the FTG image, then you can do all kinds of analysis. And in the literature, thresholds have been proposed and investigated to decide if, if we should conclude that this is viable tissue and therefore uh, intervention is required, or that um, this is scar, meaning that yeah, an old infarction, if that tissue died, then in the FDG would also be dark, just like here. And then we know that almost certainly the tissue is dead and treatment will not help anymore. And here the perfusion territories are indicated. So LAD means left anterior descendants, which is the, the dominating artery, uh, cardiac artery, then there is the right circumflex and the, uh, the right coronary artery and the left circumflex. And so they're, they're standard uh, assignments of pieces of heart to those uh, 
arteries, but actually it's not always correct because in some patients, for example, the apex is not, not um, supplied by the left anterior descendants, but by one of these two. So there is a lot of variability within the patients. So this, this uh, assignment needs not to be taken too seriously. But here, clearly, this is a occlusion in the left anterior descendants. All right. <clears throat> Here's an example of gated pet. <clears throat> so the patient has an ECG and using that ECG, the acquisition is divided in eight gates in this case. So we have, uh, yeah, we divided the cardiac period in eight pieces. The first piece goes to image one, the second piece to image two and so on. And then uh, that means that uh, if we look at gate one here, that image is formed from a lot of heartbeats always taking the first uh, uh, phase of that beat. And gate two is again an image created from many heartbeats. So here we see a kind of average uh, beating of the heart. Now, interestingly, if you, if you watch the image, then you see that uh, when the heart contracts, it looks more intense. And when it uh, expands in diastole, it, it looks grayer. Any idea why this is happening? Well, in many audiences where I asked the question, uh, one, one typical answer is that the, um, during diastole, the heart is compressed, so there would be more activity in the same volume. But that is not the case because uh, soft tissue is incompressible. So during systole, indeed the heart skip. The, the, the cavity gets smaller, but the amount of muscle in volume and weight is the same. So there is no compression. So that means that the activity concentration is not increasing. And, but that means that actually it, the color shouldn't change. And actually, if it changes, it should be the other way around. Because during the astole, a little bit of radioactivity is pressed out of the uh, blood vessels. So during uh, systole, due to the increased pressure, there is a little bit less blood in the heart than during diastole. So the, the reason for this <coughs> uh, happening is the uh, partial volume effect. So recall this slide. <coughs> so here I've put some this, this represent the radioactive discs. And if you would uh, image them, then you have to decide um, about your pixel size, which we can in, in SPECT and PET, we can freely choose that. And of course, in a single pixel, you have only one value. So you see there is pixels here that have part of the object and part of the background. We cannot put two values there. So we just put one value, which is then typically the average of the two or the sum of the two. And that means that just by using pixels of finite size, we have an incorrect representation of the activity, even if everything else would be correct. And so we see that if the object is pretty small compared to the pixel size, then the size of the object is often overestimated and the activity is underestimated. The total activity, so the, the mean times the, the volume is still okay because the photons have not escaped, they have been detected. We just didn't put them in, in the right place. If the objects get larger and larger, then you see that it, yeah, most of the object is then inside where everything is fine. The edge still has, has problems, but in large objects, the amount of edge is relatively small. So there we don't have the problem. And now the heart is operating here. The, the wall of the left ventricle is about one centimeter. So it changes from less than a centimeter to more than a centimeter during beating. And in diastole, it is significantly thinner in most patients and in most places than one centimeter. And then it starts suffering more from partial volume effect in the direction perpendicular to that wall. So it's not, not the, yeah. um, And as a result, the apparent tracer concentration is going down for the same reason that it seems to go down here. So if we do a measurement, we would overestimate the thickness of the wall because we see the the point spread function. Yeah, I should actually continue here. Even if you have perfect pixels, we have the same problem because we have a finite point spread function. So instead of pixels, we should now think of point spread functions. 
And anything small compared to the point spread function of the PET system will again be poorly represented because the, the PET or SPECT cannot uh, create objects that are smaller than, the, than its point spread function. Okay, so again, if the heart beats, it goes from here to here and we see the uh, partial volume effect. All right. <coughs> now that I'm showing these disks, uh, I'll, I'll also show this one. <coughs> um, so here, uh, there are again these disks, but now I've put the same amount of activity in each of them. So total activity is the same, but of course the concentration is lower in this one than it is in that one. And if you now image them with the system, as you can see, as a pretty large point spread function compared to the size of these, these things, we get these blobs, right? And here is a central profile to the blobs. So the, the red thing is profiled through this, and the black thing is a profile to the true object. And then uh, for the scale, the red curve, so you can see it better, and that's how it looks like. And so this is, again, to emphasize that deconvolving for that is very, very difficult. So if you would like to deconvolve the image to go from here to here, then it would be possible for, well, to do that, we should be able to see the difference between this blob and this blob. Otherwise, we cannot decide that this blob should become this object and that blob should become that object. And this is just to show that these blobs are very, very similar. And so deconvolution is extremely ill posed. We can model the resolution, but as you know from previous slides, if we try to do that, we get all kinds of artifacts because this problem is so ill posed, we need to regularize. So deconvolving is very tricky. If, uh, if you want more resolution, it's much better to measure it than to try to impose it uh, after the measurement. But anyway, so usually we consider this a, a drawback, but in this particular case, it, we can use it to our advantage. Because we see an apparent change in tracer concentration that we did not want to see, but we know it is caused by changes in wall thickness. But changes in wall thickness are clinically very relevant because only healthy or, or a living heart muscle can actually generate local contraction. So if the uh, Heart is, if, if the muscle is still alive, then we can see some changes in wall thickness. If the muscle is dead, then we either don't see changes in wall thickness or we see opposite changes completely defaced because when every, when the healthy part of the heart contracts, the pressure inside the heart increases. And then in a scar, what can happen is that the scar actually gets thinner because of that pressure, it gets stretched, stretched a bit. So we can use that and we can analyze how during the eight gates, the local activity changes. And if everything is well, then if you, if you select a pixel like that, you will see yeah, uh, this thickening and, and thinning of the wall. And in a healthy heart, this should be perfectly in phase. They all have exactly the same phase. If there is a defect, then the amplitude will be affected and the phase will be strongly affected. So this, this thickening tells us a lot that you cannot see uh, from just a tracer concentration. And here, uh, that's illustrated. So this is not our software. This is uh, um, software from uh, Cedar Sinai, <coughs> where they have done a similar thing. So they segment the left ventricle and they show it in end diastole and end systole and the lookup table is sitting here. And again, you see that there is a, a big apparent uh, difference in tracer concentration, and that's entirely due to thickness. So that way they can analyze the wall thickening, which I think is this thing here, uh, with, with, where there are scores for uh, the, the wall thickening. And then there is all kind of nice stuff. So you have uh, like a 3D representation where you see the, in the mesh, you see the end-diastolic uh, surface of the left ventricle, and then in the inside, you see the and it's systolic one, and it's colored according to the trace rotate. You can rotate that on the screen and all kind of nice stuff. Actually, the resolution of the pit is getting such that to, this is from a spec camera, and the other resolution is lousy enough for this to be very effective. If you do it on a, on a state-of-the-art PET scanner, then actually you need to do some additional smoothing, because the resolution of the pit is getting so good that it the, the partial volume effect uh, plays less because 
even if the heart is still, you start getting uh, at the right side in, in this graph. 